Okay, so looks like we are getting actually past already 1 mm -hmm. p.m. It would be Eastern, which is known at uh, my place in Chicago. So I think we can slowly get started uh, with uh, today talks, actually two talks, uh, as you can see them displayed. Uh, first, uh, maybe if you don't mind, everybody who is except the speaker will put yourself on, on mute so we don't interfere. You can keep your videos uh, as long as you know the bandwidth is fine, I think. And uh, with that said, I'll go on and introduce <clears throat> and say first of all about the seminar of uh, today. It is a special event that we sort of decided to have within this uh, seminar series. It's called Early Career Talks. Uh, early career is not precisely defined, but something that we have in mind is uh, maybe a postdoc, maybe the first two years of the tenure track position. And uh, we'll have from time to time this type of talks, uh, hosting two of them at one event. And uh, each talk is 25 minutes long, plus questions. As usual, after the talk, uh, you'll have a chance to ask a question, but also after the both talks, we'll have uh, more time to ask questions and discussions uh, about uh, these particular talks or in general about math finance. So stay, uh, stay after the talks too. Questions, um, we will not accept questions during the talk, but uh, because the talk is short, uh, usually we pause in the middle. Uh, although after the first talk, we'll have uh, a short uh, Q&A uh, session and then you can ask uh, questions the easiest way probably is to post your question in the chat area and we will either read them or even better, if you are fine, we can turn your mic on or you can turn your mic on and ask yourself. Um, and with that said, uh, we are ready to start with the first speaker of uh, today, who is uh, Rui Meng Hu. Uh, Rui Meng just joined the University of Santa Barbara, California Santa Barbara, as a joint appointment between the Department of Math and Department of uh, Stats and Probability. Um, before that, she was at uh, Columbia in Department of Stats as a postdoc. And before that, she was actually again at UCSB working with uh, Jean-Pierre Fouque and uh, her research interests are spanning from machine learning, uh, mean field gains, uh, portfolio optimization, systemic risk. Uh, she was also finalist of two SIAM conference paper prizes in 16 and 19. And uh, today, um, I think maybe, Rumeng, maybe you can share your screen. Okay. And today talk would be actually on deep fictitious play for stochastic differential games. Let me uh, try to share my screen. Can you see the yes. sharing? Yes, we see the sharing. So maybe you can make it full screen. Uh, and full screen mode. Okay. Does Perfect. this look good? Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Remain, uh, please go ahead. Okay. Well, thank you for the nice introduction and also for this invitation. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about this uh, a machine learning technique for solving stochastic differential games, which I term as the Deep fictitious play, and from the, the 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 name, you may guess there's two components in this algorithm. One is the deep learning part, and the other is the fictitious play, the idea of fictitious play. So we will go to these two points later, and in particular, the uh, the scheme of the game that I'm interested in is the moderate uh, player game. So the number of the players that I have in mind is between like 10 to 100, where the, num the number of the players is not, not that large, where the mean field games start to uh, perform as well. But also on the other side, it is now so, so, uh, a small number of player games such that the conventional numerical methods start, uh, works well. Okay, and why I'm interested in this regime because I think there are a, a, a lot of um, many interesting applications, and in particular, the one that I would like to mention a little bit is uh, application in the fintech industry is the uh, competition. So, so this type of uh, games is a good uh, is appropriate to model the combination in this P2P lending platform. So first of all, what is the P2P lending platform? So this is a platform try to connect the lenders and the borrowers together. So the borrower, the borrowers want to borrow some money, want a loan, and they want to, do not want to go to the commercial banks. So they come to the platforms, they submit their uh, 
uh, some information like the, the, the credit score, the bank statement, and then they can get a rate from their, their loan. And then uh, the, the platform will charge there some fee, which is called original, origination fee. And then they, the platform will show those loans to the lenders for the lenders to do the investment. So the, 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 there are several factors that the, the platform can control. First of all, they control this original fee charged uh, on the borrowers, and they also control the interest rate they pay to the lenders. And most importantly, they will control the, 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 the effort they made for uh, controlling the, uh, for screening the credit risk. That means how much effort they want to uh, spend on uh, giving them uh, credit A, B, C, or D. That, that describe how, how, how likely they are going to default their loan. Okay, and of course there's more than one uh, P2P lending platform on the market. And the next slide is just wanna show that the, how heterogeneous the market is, how heterogeneous the, the, the platform is. And this is a non exhaustive list up to like 2016. So you, you can see that they have different volume of their low amount. They can have different uh, loan terms, different rate and fees. And more importantly, they, they spend different, well, they spend different efforts on how to controlling the credit risk. They ask different kinds of information. Some of them only ask for the credit scores and some of uh, ask for more information. So I think this is a, this is very like interesting problem and this is a, uh, can, can be modeled as a stochastic differential games between uh, different players and they are, and for simplicity, we can assume that they, or they have the same like uh, investment, well, game period from zero to time, time capital T. Okay. And of course, there are other uh, applications in my mind, for example, uh, how to uh, determine like this uh, optimal liquidation rate for this institutional uh, traders, where all of them want to clear their positions and then uh, how, how to determine this, the, the rate of playing orders on the market so that they can maximize their uh, revenue. Or the balance at the end, or in the insurance market, what is the uh, the, the, the optimal premium between different uh, like uh, companies? And for all of them, I think the one main concern or one main question is this optimal thing, and this is um, naturally like described by the Nash equilibrium of the game, because you, usually in, in most of the scenario, this is a, a non-cooperative game where uh, the Nash equilibrium is of the relevance. And when the number of the players becomes larger and larger, it's, um, for example, more than 10 players, then people are facing the curse of dimensionality when, of trying to find a Nash equilibrium. Usually for conventional numerical methods, um, people, uh, we can do like three dimension or five dimension or uh, possibly 10 is doable, but beyond that, um, uh, things start to get uh, getting hard. Okay. And of course, there are some uh, limitations for the, uh, the, for the uh, algorithms that I'm going to propose today. Uh, that is, when the number of the player number of the players are extremely large, then of course we, we should uh, rely on this uh, mean field theory. And then uh, there are also a lot a lot of ongoing works uh, using deep learning and mean field theory, which I will mention a little bit in the in, in the later slides. Okay, but. Uh, so, so, so to uh, summarize a little bit, so the, the problem that I'm focusing on here is a finite number of the player game where this N is between like 10 to 100. And, and then we're also able to deal with heterogeneous players and also the common noise. This is because we are directly tackled this N player game. And we try to solve each player's optimization separately so heterogeneity is not a problem in this proposed algorithm, okay? This is not like the mean field theory where people usually require, uh, there's uh, uh, many, uh, in ho uh, many homo uh, homogeneous players, okay? okay? And this is pretty much the framework that uh, I'm going to uh, work with. So each of the player has its own uh, cost functional or reward functional, depending on whether we want to minimize something or what we want to maximize something. If we want to relate the, the whole thing to the uh, to the P2P 
uh, landing platform compilation, then this is like the platform profit for the, the for, for the for the uh, platform I, and then everybody has its own control dynamics. And here we allow the common noise and also the individual noise. So WI here is the brown emotion for the player I. This is the individual noise, and then W0 is the common noise, which appears in everybody's uh, state uh, dynamics. And again, usually if n is larger than 10, then it's hard to compute by conventional methods, but this is possibly overcome by deep learning. And uh, in this talk, we will introduce two kinds of deep learning techniques to deal with open loop Nash equilibrium and also Markovic Nash equilibrium. Okay, so here it's a, a little bit uh, for the main contributions, the summary for this contribution. So we propose methodologies, which we call it fixed play for two kinds of Nash equilibrium, the open loop one, uh, which was in the paper of uh, my paper in, in 2019. And also we have a recent work on the Markovic Nash equilibrium, the, the algorithm part. This is in, uh, this is a joint work with uh, Han from Princeton. And we also provide some uh, a convergence analysis for the fictitious play, and there are some uh, related uh, work. One is uh, in my previous paper, and the other one was a joint work with uh, Han and Long from Princeton. Of course, there are a lot of uh, there. There's uh, a quite a few like uh, uh, ongoing research in this area, like uh, focusing on the game and also the uh, the deep learning part. And most of them are the mean field games uh, plus the deep learning. And here is a non-exhaustive list of this ongoing work. And not only. Uh, most of the, uh, the, 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 the works are from our field, from mass finance, but th there's one, uh, the fourth one, which is from the CS um, community. So not only our community are doing this part, there are other areas who are also are interested in the, those topics. Okay. okay. So now lo let's look at this uh, mathematical modeling. So here I uh, uh, go with the scenario that we we, uh, we minimize the cost. So again, here is the dynamics with the common noise and also the uh, uh, individual noise. And then um, people try to minimize their uh, uh, cost. And previously, I always use an uh, example, which is like the prisoner dilemma. So that's why I here I have some interpretation where it, this alpha is related to the level of the confession when they are investigated in, in the jail. Uh, and, and then this cost is like interpreted as like how many years they, they, they were put in a jail if they are uh, for, for, for one uh, choice. And of course, the, uh, uh, in a game feature, in a game, the player I's decision will, of course, the, uh, influence the player J's uh, cost. So that's why the, 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 the every player's cost would uh, be a function, would be a function of everybody's decision. Okay, and then for such a non-cooperative game, uh, a good notion is called a national equilibrium, and mathematically that, that means this is a collection of strategies in the admissible set where uh, for anyone in the game and for any strategy within the, uh, the strategy, uh, admissible strategy profile, you can never, uh, if you deviate from this collection, you can never try to, uh, you can never try to lower the, the cost again. Okay, and then this, uh, depending on what is available, uh, uh, in this admissible profile or, depend, uh, or uh, depending on what is observed by the players, we have different, uh, different definition for the national equilibrium, uh, open loop or closed loop or the closed loop in the feedback form, AKA the Markov in case. And this talk will give an idea uh, how to solve the open loop one and also the feedback form one. Okay. So the idea is similar. And, uh, uh, so let's see uh, the, the, like the, 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 the main steps for, for this algorithm. So for both cases, for both the open loop one and the Markovian one, we will start with a, a smooth initial strategy, which we call alpha zero. And then we will solve this optimization problems again, again, again. But we assume that at, uh, at the beginning of, at each stage, uh, the player I would assume all the other players are using the strategy from their previous stage. Therefore, those end problems will be decoupled and then they can be solved simultaneously. So the, the, the current stage optimization problem will not affect each other. 
but of course then this cannot be solved in one stage so you you want to solve those and the couple optimization problems again 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 and try hope that at the end this will converge to an actual equilibrium and depending on how you solve those n individual optimization problems, we can uh, we will be able to find a national equilib a Markovian equilibrium or an open loop one. Okay, so yeah, and of course after the decoupling, because we have a num a, like a large number of the players, we may still face an uh, a curse of dimensionality, and usually there's no an analytical solutions, so we need to solve uh, numerically, and this is where we use deep learning. So the, the difference for these two kinds of national equilibrium is how we use deep learning to solve this individual uh, optimization problem. Okay. So let me start with the open loop case. So in the open loop one, uh, we use the idea of direct parameterization of the optimal control. So basically, uh, by the nature of, uh, by the definition, open loop means the decision is made based on the uh, uh, the, 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 the noises from, uh, uh, from time zero to time uh, small t, okay? So then we use a shallow neural network at each time point, try to uh, ap approximate this optimal policy. So it, 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 at each time, we consider this part as an input, this is the common noise, this critics version of the, com of the auto noise that we can, uh, the, the players can observe so far. And then there would be a, a, a neural network uh, to, to approximate and then output the candidate of the optimal control for the player I at this time step. And then after we have this uh, uh, candidate, you can compute the running cost, update the, uh, the state processes by the Euler scheme, and then uh, at the end, we'll, we will also be able to compute the, uh, the terminal cost, okay? And then there, there is a, a cost of functional, which is interpreted as the loss of the neural network that will be minimized at the end, okay? So maybe a little bit more details on this part. The, the, the thing that uh, the first step is try to discretize the, the, the integral from the, in, uh, the continuous framework. And then by open loop, we means that this optimal control, the candidate would be a function of all the noises that we, can, we have observed so far. And then we will learn this by a deep neural network. Well, for, for each step, this, this could be a shallow ne uh, neural network. That may, means we parameterize this uh, function using some uh, parameters from the uh, neural networks. And then the, optimal, uh, the optimization problem for this player I becomes to uh, uh, minimize the, the, the parameters from the neural network such that the whole thing is minimized. And the, the last step will be done by uh, like the stochastic gradient descent uh, algorithms. And then you will be able to find, well, uh, in, print, in theory, if, uh, well, not even in theory, we hope that we will be able to find a op, uh, near optimal minimizer uh, theta, which gives us the uh, solution, what the optimal response for the player i and at stage n minus one. And so here we use two features uh, of the uh, deep learning, which are the ability to approximate the complex relation from this observed noise to the optimal control, and also the well-developed building solver, which is really efficient. Okay, and then the, 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 the example that we, um, we test on is the linear quadratic games. And the reason is very obvious because it has the closed form solutions as benchmark and it also has the uh, common noise which uh, is easily handled by the fixed display. So for us, uh, for one additional noise is simply to simulate one more brown motion in this algorithm. And before that, let's see some convergence theory. So for the linear quadratic games, we can show that uh, the, the family of the uh, optimal response from stage to stage, it exists and it converges under appropriate conditions. And it also forms an open loop Nash equilibrium. So we indeed get what we want if we use the fixed display. And also the, uh, the limit doesn't uh, depend on where we start the initial choice. So no matter how, how, where we start, we will always converge to the, 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 the Nash equilibrium that we want. And the proof relies on the FBS, the uh, argument. Sorry, uh, can I ask how, how much time do I have? 
Yes, you can. So you have about like eight minutes. Eight minutes. Okay. Yeah, I seven, see. eight minutes. Okay, cool. Thanks. Yeah. So uh, for, for this part, uh, the, the, the lucky thing is that this FBSD can be decoupled uh, into a forward component versus a back component so that we can estimate uh, these two components, the, the increment of these two components from stage to stage separately, and then using a contraction uh, mapping uh, argument, we were able to uh, uh, show the convergence of this family alpha n to the, to the thing that we want. So this is the convergence part. And for the general games, this is a still an ongoing work. And so at this moment, what we have is the linear quadratic case. Okay. And here are some numerics. And so in this particular game, in this particular example, the number of the players that I pick is 24. And the reason is that um, at that moment, I have eight GPUs. So, so the, the advantage of this algorithm is that you can always do solving those n player uh, an individual optimization problems in a parallel line, in a parallel manner and at that moment I have eight GPUs so I pick a number which can be divided by eight and I distribute like three uh, jobs to each of the GPU okay and uh, the relative error so for, for this example we have the the ground truth so we can benchmark uh, the, the algorithm and the, the relative error for the uh, uh, for the for the uh, the, the, the game value is below 3% after like 10 uh, stages. So the, the left panel is uh, the maximum relative error from stage to stage. And you can see that after the first two or three steps, uh, this, uh, this error of the game value uh, goes down uh, uh, very quickly. And on, on, on the right hand side, this is the, uh, this is a plot for the uh, ground truth controlled optimal uh, uh, state processes versus the, uh, the, the, the approximations. So the solid lines are the truth and then the stars are the approximations. And I didn't plot all the players because that will be really a mess. So I, I, I picked a selective uh, a, a, a group of all the players and then you can see that they start uh, apart from each other, but they try to get together at the end. And this is consistent with the, the game that we, we, we showed at the beginning, because you can see the cost that that, that can punish uh, a lot if the, the players are stay away from, uh, from each other. Okay, so this is, this is just a sanity check for the numerics. Okay, and that is uh, what uh, pretty much what I want to say about the uh, open loop case. For the closed loop, there's a completely different um, uh, algorithm. Because for the for the Markovian case, we have the IJP approach, and this gives us uh, uncoupled equations. But then, the first uh, first of all, we still use the, the fictitious play idea to decouple this equation into an individual uh, uh, semi-linear uh, uh, PDEs, and which we will solve uh, repeatedly. And for the semi-linear PDEs, so here, this is the uh, the equation. The, the first line, the first equation is the one. Um, after we use the decoupling, where this alpha minus n minus i n that represents the uh, optimal response uh, from other players from the previous stage. Okay, and then for such a semi-linear PDEs, we have nice BSD reformulation. So it, the resolution is also always related to the BSDs, and then we can. Um, where the solution of the BSDs can be converted as uh, can can be can 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 be reformulated again as as solving a variational problem and then and then here we will use the deep learning techniques to solve this variational problem. So this part was proposed in a paper by Han Jensen and, and Weina Er from a PNAS paper. And basically, uh, uh, they, they, they use deep learning to parameterize the initial position y0 and also this adjoint process z so that both x and y are simulated forwardly and they, they want to minimize the, uh, the, the discrepancy between the truth, which is the g, and also the, the approximation from the deep learning. And we also have a convergence theory. So in this part, for drift control only games, we will be able to show the existence of the, the family, the, the, the response, and then it converts to a Markovian Nash equilibrium and the appropriate conditions. And the techniques that we are using here is the, uh, the BSD reformulation of the, the, the semilinear PD and then the convergence on the BSDs. Okay, and this is, a, this is a manuscript that we will post online uh, very soon. And then maybe 
the last slide that I'm going to uh, show is the, the last two slides. It's about again the numerics. And here in the Markovian case, we will be able to find some benchmark which has heterogeneous agents. So this is <clears throat> sorry, this is the uh, the called the uh, risk sensitive uh, linear quadratic game. So the, the dynamics and the uh, cost are. I'm sorry, the dynamics and then the running and terminal cost are the same as before, but in the cost functional, we have this exponential uh, formula. And the, the here theta is called the risk sensitive parameters, uh, we, uh, which can describe the uh, risk tolerance of the agents. And in the numerics, we choose theta to be different to describe the, this, the heterogeneity. And again, we also have common incorporated common noise here. And in this case, this is also easily handled by the depicted display. This means we increase one more dimensionality in the in the so sometimes it means we increase one more dimensionality in the in, in solving the BSDs. And then this is not a, a, a big problem. And in this in this case, we do not have analytical solutions, but the, the benchmark solution can be provided by solving a a system of matrix Riccati equations. So this can be solved offline with uh, uh, and and uh, use, using a very fine uh, uh, numerical methods. So then the, uh, the the next plot is uh, a comparison between this so-called uh, ground truth solution, which we solved offline, and also the the deep neural network approximation. So the top two panels here are the uh, optimal state processes. The solid, solid line, the, the, the solid lines are uh, as usual. The, the ground truths here are provided by the uh, uh, bench uh, uh, solution of the matrix equation, and then the dots are the approximations, and the bottom lines are the approximations of the control and its ground truths for comparison. Okay, and this is a pretty much I want to say for the talk. And here's a quick summary. Uh, we basically propose the the fictitious, fictitious play algorithm for both the open loop case and the Markovian case. We are also provide some uh, convergence theory for the two algorithms that we propose. And there are some ongoing works which we want to analyze the game with past dependent controls or on the uh, stochastic networks. And also when we have the controlled volatility case, how to uh, uh, take that into cooperation and also some real applications like the COVID-19, how to deal with that. Okay. Okay. All thank right. you for the attention. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Raymond, uh, for the nice talk. Uh, we can accept probably one or two very quick questions. Uh, I see that Andrew uh, is asking. So, uh, Andrew, can you turn on your mic and mic and ask yourself? Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Raymond. Very nice talk. Thank you very much. So, I. Hi, I'm Andrew. Curious, uh, mm -hmm. um, I'm just curious, in your uh, simulations, can you claim that the collective distribution of the individual states of all 20, so you have 24 players, right? In your, yeah, you know, in that particular example. Uh, can you yeah. claim that the collective distributions, the collective distribution of their optimal state converges as the time horizon converges to infinity? That's a that's a good question. Let me see. Mm, you mean theoretically, because numerically well, deep I mean, learning I, cannot I, do I, I, when it is really way, large. Uh -huh. So numerically, the, the the answer is easy. So the uh, uh, numerically, we uh, I think deep learning can only do with uh, like a finite uh, capital T. Yeah. So because at the end of the day, you need to discretize the whole time horizon into small steps. And then the, the larger T is, the harder the, the algorithm will be. So the, 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 the deeper the, 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 the neural network will be, and then the longer the time uh, it will take to train it. But for, for and, uh, theoretically, uh, I, I haven't thought about games with uh, even time horizon. I mean, for stochastic differential games. But I, I believe that if you deal with uh, infinite time horizon. Uh, well, I mean, see. the convergence, usually Markov chains, they can, they can converge to the 
state state distribution mm -hmm. quite fast. distribution so you don't have to necessarily mm -hmm. go to a very large number so uh, in any case I don't want to take more <laughs> all right thank you thank you, thank you Andrew mm -hmm. for asking and uh, I, we are sort of pressed by time, but I think to keep the momentum, actually, I want to allow one more question. Mm -hmm. So since we're talking about this, Sebastian, you have a question. Why don't you ask it directly? So mm -hmm. thank you. Uh, sure. Um, thanks, Roman. Interesting, interesting mm -hmm. work. I, I really like it. I did have a question on thank the you. SGD step, though. Mm -hmm. So in the, this is for the open loop case. When, mm -hmm. you're, when you're computing the, the loss and doing the mm -hmm. SGD steps to learn the parameters in the network, are you computing mm -hmm. loss on, under the entire trajectory or just the latest, um, the latest set of observations? And the reason I ask is it seems as if you get really good, accurate results along the entire path and, not, mm -hmm. and, and it's not as if they're inaccurate at first and then they start to become mm -hmm. accurate. So <laughs> how, how do you get that? So, so I, I think I calculate uh, uh, the loss is by, by this uh, this expression, so it's along the whole trajectory from time zero to time capital T. So, so it's mm -hmm. not only the the, uh, the 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 last time step. No, no. Yeah. And so the strategies at the earlier time steps, even though they were obtained using earlier iterations of the of the um, approximate uh, strategies, you you sort of update them uh, when you recompute this loss, or do you use so, so every time at every mm -hmm. stage, uh, a whole uh, uh, control from time zero to time capital T is obtained. Okay, 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 uh -huh. got it. So I'm not, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thanks. All right, thank you. So uh, again, we'll have uh, much more time to talk uh, uh, more questions and discussion after the second talk too. So we are ready to move to the second talk. Max, maybe you could share your screen with us and... Um, Okay. All right. So looks like we are all set. So we are moving on to the next uh, talk uh, of the early career talks. And it's my pleasure to introduce Max Rappin, who is just joining uh, the Questrom School of Business at BU at Boston University as, as an assistant professor. Uh, Max graduated with his PhD from ETH Zurich uh, with Metasoner. And then he moved to Worthy at uh, Princeton University for one year and now at uh, BU, works in mathematical finance, uh, known for his works on uh, optimal stochastic control and um, optimal dividends uh, payments, and also numerical and machine learning methods for stochastic control problems. And today, Max is going to talk about discrete dividends in continuous time. Max, please go ahead. Thank you for the introduction, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. So this is joint work with Yusi uh, Keppo and Mita Zonar. And uh, as said, uh, this will be on, uh, on disc discrete dividends in continuous time. Uh, I'll say, though, that I think the mathematical structure is, uh, is more easily uh, seen or understood in, with a more abstract notation to not get too bogged down into the notational details of dividends. So I'll, I'll start there. Uh, so we, we set up a control problem with a state process x. So we have two controls. One is a continuous control. I'll color code it uh, in orange. It's active at any point in time. Uh, the other one is a discrete control in blue, and it, act, it may be active at, uh, at regular intervals. So zero, capital T, two capital T, and so on. We, we also have uh, continuous and discrete rewards, so shorthand on left-hand side of these uh, expressions. So the continuous one is a function of, of the continuous control and the state, and the discrete one a function of the discrete control, control and the state. We will solve uh, an infinite horizon control problem, and we discrete at, uh, discount at uh, rate rho. So the value function is then the supremum over controls of the expectation of the total rewards. So the continuous control, of course, we integrate and the discrete control we sum up, both with discounting. So this is uh, nothing odd. Uh, what, what we will do next is to apply the dynamic programming principle at right before time capital T. And then we get the following expression. So first, the, the uh, continuous reward from zero to T, the discrete reward at time zero, plus the continuation value. So 
the important thing to observe here is that the discrete control is only uh, showing up here at as the time zero discrete reward and a potential jump at time zero. So we define these two operators, C and D, continuous and discrete. So C is the supremum over the continuous controls. And then we take uh, the continuous reward plus the continuation. So you see this as these two terms. We take in the continuous operator. The discrete operator, we take the instantaneous decision uh, problem at the uh, conti uh, discrete intervals. So that's the discrete reward uh, plus the continuation. And now if we look at the structure of these uh, and at their competition, uh, composition, we were led to believe that the fixed point of the composition, so the composition operator is T, uh, should be the value function. And this is, this is the general structure we will try to exploit here. And our goal is to find a metric space such that T is a strict contraction and B is an element of the metric space. If this is the case, uh, then we can find a fixed point, a unique fixed point, and we can iterate and hopefully that fixed point is the value function. Uh, you can think of the, this iteration as a, as a value iteration just with unusual control structure. So that's the, that's, uh, the analog to more normal situations. Uh, and this is what we will, we will do today. Uh, we will get some PD results along the way. So now we can move on to uh, looking at the dividends. Uh, and the, the general goal of these optimal dividend problems is to assign a value to a cash flow under a liquidity constraint. Uh, the interpretation of this is uh, finding the value of a limited liability firm with this cash flow. And the way we do this is we look at the expected value of future discounted dividends, so the expected net present value, and maximize over dividend strategies. Uh, so because of this liquidity constraint, we have to keep track of the firm reserves, and that's a very central uh, part of this problem. And what happens in most uh, of these models is, uh, is the two, two properties of, of the optimal dividend policy is that often it has uh, regular, irregular intervals of dividend pay, payouts, and uh, it's often at an infinite rate. So. Uh, one, one instance is you could have a Brownian model and you get some Brownian local time. And neither of these, these two properties is necessarily what we see in practice. So uh, there are some questions uh, here to answer. Not every model has these properties. For instance, uh, there are some models uh, which set the dividend payout rate to be in a fine or proportional function of the current reserves. And then it's a continuous flow of dividends. Uh, that's that's uh, uh, addressing this irregularity. The infinite rate, there are ways to. The most natural is to look at a discrete time problem. Uh, there are other ways too with random dividend payout times, but what we want is to capture this discrete time property where it's really quite regular. Uh, uh, but we want to uh, allow for more interesting dynamics. So in particular, by doing discrete dividends, in continuous time, we allow the firm to make other, for instance, operational decisions between dividend payouts. So now we can move on to the mathematical model. So we, we consider a cash flow denoted by C and take a Brownian motion with drift. We can generalize this, but this is one of the more typical models. And we denote by X the reserves of this firm and X fluctuates uh, as C net dividend payments uh, and equity issuance. So L is the cumulative dividend, dividends paid out and I is the cumulative equity issued. They are adapted increasing RCLL, but the important restriction on the dividends is you cannot pay out more than your current reserves. We also need uh, the following definition of a ruin time or a time of ruin. And that's the first time at which the reserves dip below zero. So this is a game over type of situation. Now we're ready to set up the objective function and issuance doesn't come for free. So we have uh, two uh, parameters here, 
describing the issuance cost, the fixed and or a proportional cost. So then the payoff of this uh, dividend strategy, sorry, I, I'm doing the continuous model first because it's a bit easier on the ice. So a continuous dividend strategy and a continuous issuance strategy, given the initial reserves X is equal to the expectation of discounted dividends until the time of ruin minus the cost of issuance and the issuance. So if we want to move to a discrete model, uh, what we naturally do is we just restrict uh, the dividends to be discrete. So instead of this sum, we have, uh, instead of this integral, we have a sum. So now we sum up all the dividends until the time of ruin. Note here that, that the issuance is still in continuous time, so they can happen between uh, dividend payments. So this is important. And the value function is the supremum over the payoff uh, over uh, the dividends and issuance strategies. And if we take this problem and we approach it just like before, we define two operators, uh, C and D, and they come, come to us just like uh, in the abstract situation. Notation is a bit more involved here, but they're the same. We hope to find a fixed point uh, of the composition operator, T, uh, and then we, we want the value function to be the limit. So this would, for instance, allow us to solve this numerically. Uh, but before we get there, uh, we have this theorem, which states that let's let xA be the set of functions that are continuous, non-decreasing, and grow as x, and uh, endow this with a uniform metric. Then there exists an A star, such that T is a strict contraction on xA whenever A is large enough, so larger than A star. So this gives precisely this uh, fixed point property of T. I have not yet told you that the value function is the fixed point. We'll get there soon. But before, before I move away from the slide, I want, I want you to look at this uh, structure. And then what we see here is that this is just, uh, this is an impulse control problem, finite time horizon. So we, we can just write down the dynamic programming equation. Uh, so that's this expression here. So this is a free boundary problem. We have an inactivity region and we have an equity issuance uh, region. So this equity issuance region has this non-local supremum operator. This is typical for impulse control problems. Uh, as boundary value, uh, as initial value, we have phi. And this on the X boundary, we have the maximum of zero and the equity issuance. So this, this is just a condition that when reserves are zero, the firm makes the decision whether to issue equity to stay in the game or accept ruin. The important property I would like to point out here is that since this PD represents uh, the control problem, we have that the PD at time T with initial condition phi is equal to the C operator acting on phi. So let's carry over this uh, PD to the next slide. So this is precisely what you saw. And uh, we can prove the following uh, theorem. So define XAT to be the set of functions now of T and X, otherwise very similar to XA, of continuous functions, non-decreasing in X and growing as X, slightly adjusted for the time. Then for each phi in XA, so each initial condition, there exists a unique solution to the PD in this uh, set XAT. So this gives us all the regularity we, we could want uh, and we'll, we'll use this in a moment. But first, as I promised, uh, this is the result stating that the value function is indeed the uh, unique fixed point of the operator T. So we put these results together uh, for one final observation before the numerics. Uh, let take the PD and let the initial condition be the value function. Let little v be the corresponding solution to the PD. Then recall that we have this property uh, that C acting on the initial condition gives you the PD solution at time capital T. So then we start here, the PD solution at time zero is equal to the value function, that's the initial condition. The value function is a fixed point to the composition operator. 
And now we use this last property in the last step to, uh, to get V of capital T here. And now we see we have a coupling between V at time zero and V at time capital T. Uh, and we plug this into the PD. So this structure is the same. The X boundary condition is the same, but now we, we replace the initial condition with this periodic condition. So now we have a periodic PD and what's quite interesting about this is that it captures the full structure of this uh, discrete continuous control problem through the periodicity. Okay, so now we can, we can look at what uh, solutions to this look like. Um, so let's begin without uh, equity issuance. On the horizontal axis here, we have the reserves. So these are functions of the reserves. Uh, in particular, the lines up here are the value functions. There are three of them. I'll explain what they, what they are. The top one is the continuous one. So we continuously paid dividends. The, the next one is discrete dividend payouts. So that's what we've been discussing so far. Uh, and we, on the bottom here, we have two values, uh, xc and xd continuous and discrete respectively. And these are, these characterize the optimal control. So these are levels uh, with a property that whenever the reserves exceed these levels, uh, the excess is paid out. So we can make two observations. First of all, there is some loss in value from moving from a continuous world to a discrete world. This is not surprising because we restrict the controls. But what's more interesting is that this, uh, this dividend paying payment barrier uh, moves down a bit. What this means is that, uh, that in a discrete world, firms disc discreetly paying firms uh, keep a lower buffer. So uh, and the interpretation is some type of uh, time value of money uh, situation. So it's better to pay out a little bit extra now, despite a greater risk for uh, ruin instead of sitting on the money for the whole time period. Uh, at the bottom here, we have the dashed blue line. This is the loss for moving from a continuous world to a discrete world. It's uh, for these parameter values a bit above 1%. So this, this is 1% of the firm value. So this is not insignificant. Uh, so finally on this slide, I would like to point out this last curve, the dotted red line. You could imagine a discrete world where the firm management solves the continuous problem as an approximation. They found, find this continu continuous barrier implemented in a discrete world. So of course, this is not optimal in the discrete world. So the loss is slightly larger. And what we observe is the loss in rel a rel relative to the previous loss I discussed this uh, is doubling. So we have a 2% loss. Uh, so this is a figure with issuance. Uh, we'll see more issuance in a moment. Uh, so I'll skip this for now. So let's look at an extension of this problem. Uh, spice it up a bit. Uh, remember C is the cash flow and we can now let it depend on some other process view. What I would like you to think about is, uh, think of is C being almost like before, but with a stochastic drift. So this drift we call profitability. And uh, we would like it to be, for instance, Ornst and Ullenbeck or CIR. That's, that's what I have in mind. So we enlarge the state space to keep track of the current profitability. And we can define the uh, operators analogously to before. And we have a result similar to before, some technical conditions. So this is an integrability condition on C. Uh, C should be well behaved enough. Uh, so if under this integrability condition, we can construct a metric space such that the operator uh, maps uh, X into itself uh, and is a strict contraction and the value function is the unique fixed point. So this is precisely the, res the same type of result as before. Uh, important to point out is uh, this is satisfied uh, by this type of structure. So Onstein, Ullenbeck or CIR, but by other things too. Uh, and again, we have this type of 
structure. So if we iterate this op iteratively apply this operator to any starting point, we eventually recover the value function. So this is this is how we solve the problem numerically. Uh, so this is a figure describing the solution. This is without issuance. I'll try to explain what you're seeing. Forget about the gray region for now and focus on these, uh, on these black lines. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the state space. On the vertical axis, you have the current reserves. Uh, on the horizontal axis, you have the current profitability. So here times are really bad. Here times are really good. Uh, inside this region is the uh, non-activity region, so nothing is done. Uh, dividend payments decrease uh, uh, the current reserve, so paying dividends means we move down in this figure, and we pay dividends whenever we're up here, for instance, so we move down until we reach this boundary. So this acts like this uh, barrier we saw before in the one-dimensional problem. We also have this lower boundary. I call that a liquidation boundary because what happens is when we're outside of this region, when we're outside here, we pay dividends uh, down and eventually we reach zero, which is the ruin time. So this is in some sense, some voluntary liquidation. Uh, this is not a property of the discrete dividends. So I will not, it's interesting on its own, but uh, not going to it much further here. Uh, what we can observe though is for the most part, like before the buffer, is lower in the discrete case. Uh, in this region, when times are really bad, the disc in the discrete world, a uh, bigger buffer is held. Uh, another important thing is uh, the discreetly paying firm has a lower tolerance for, uh, for this uh, liquidity constraint. Oh, sorry, not liquidity constraint, but uh, for low, uh, for bad times, so to say. They, they will want to liquidate earlier. Uh, so this is in the, without equity issuance. With equity issuance, we get a figure that is more similar to the one dimensional because, uh, because now the whole upper buffer barrier uh, is below the continuous version. Sorry if I didn't say so. Uh, the continuous version is the one in the background. I'm, I'm so sorry. Uh, uh, but otherwise, the general structure uh, is the same. So finally, let's, uh, let's compare the loss from going from a continuous world to a discrete world. Uh, and we, we have this heat map of the loss. And we see that the loss varies a lot within this region from a few percent to 24%. So along this uh, liquidation boundary, uh, we see losses of up to 24% with this during bad times. Uh, during better times in, in ideal situations uh, without issuance, the losses drop down to 3%. Uh, with the equity issuance, uh, the story, story is similar, but numbers are lower. Uh, we have the high losses around the liquidation uh, boundary. So these losses are about 8% or up to 8% and then they decay down to 1% during the best of times. So th these are losses in, in firm value. So losses of several percent firm value, that's, uh, that's quite a bit. So I would, uh, I would like to uh, close with, with uh, saying that this suggests that it's quite important to, uh, to think of what type of dividend payout schemes we're interested in studying because uh, at least on the value, it has a, has a big impact. So I will close with that and uh, I thank you for your attention. Thank you, thank you, Max, for the nice talk and we are right on time, which is very much appreciated actually for both speakers because, uh, you know, um, and uh, the floor is open for questions for Max for now, uh, and then we'll open, I mean, the, the open-end questions for everybody. So I think uh, Andrew has uh, a question. Andrew, you can ask, please. Thank you, Max. Uh, very interesting talk. 
Uh, I have a question. When new shares are issued, this decision is made by the present shareholders. And this, of course, dilutes their ownership. So uh, do you, uh, maybe I missed it. I tried to, to track this fine point, but do you take into account the dilution of ownership? Yeah, so let me get back to uh, sharing. I, I exited. Uh, so this, uh, this is quite subtle. It's a very good question. Uh, let's go down to the right slide. So even though it's not directly apparent, it is captured by, by this condition. And uh, unfortunately, I don't have extra slides describing why. I can send you, I have a sh very short write-up explaining why this condition takes that into account precisely what you ask for. It takes into, into account this dilution. Uh, but it has to do with uh, the idea that uh, the price, uh, the, the fact that, that the dilution will happen is already priced before. And if you, if you work this backwards, I actually you, you end up with this uh, condition. I can send you the details. Uh, Separately, it's it's not it's not trivial to see. I I have to say. Okay, no, I kind of understand the idea. But, All right. Yeah. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Andrew, for the question, and uh, Max, uh, thank you one more time for the. Um, and okay, so we have one more question. I thought to wrap it up, but uh, Sebastian, uh, please uh, go ahead and ask your question or two. <clears throat> Oh, sure. Well, we could also take it during the casual session. No, but, no, um, it's fine. I mean, <laughs> it would be fair to have two and two questions and answers. So, um. all right. Um, I was just wondering. So, you you discussed the error in going from um, continuous payments uh, with the continuous process versus the discrete times at which you pay, and there's uh, quite a range in, in in how much you suffer by by doing this. Uh, what I'm wondering is if you count for if you think about model uncertainty, is it is it washed out by model uncertainty? Because you know people trying to estimate things like their firm expected return and volatility of the the profits uh, are probably uh, or probably have fair amount of error in them. And then does that error is it of the same order of magnitude from going from continuous to discrete, or is it uh, completely different? That's uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, I I don't have a direct answer because I haven't looked at it. Uh, yeah, it's it's it would be worth studying, I think. Um, but it's it would in the end the precise answer whether whether these are of similar size would depend on the size of the uh, uncertainty, for instance. And the the cost here is uh, is heavily dependent on on the discount rate, uh, of course. So to uh, to compare. Uh, size of different effects uh, in magnitude, one would probably have to really look at it in detail. I have a hard time uh, say, saying yes or no. Granted. All right. <laughs> All right. Thank you. So uh, before closing the recording and moving to the um, uh, other session of uh, questions and discussions, I'll have some couple of small announcements and then Agustin will say a couple of words too. So first of all, we'll have next talk on August 20. So we decided to have one talk only in August, you know, it's summer, uh, regardless of anything what's happening. And uh, we'll have Paolo Guassoni uh, speaking um, on August 20. More details about the future lineup of the speakers, past speakers, uh, actually past videos, recorded videos you can find on our website uh, that I will post uh, shortly in, a, in the chat area. Uh, I think the Bachelor of Finance Society is not going to have any talks in September, but you can check their website too. And uh, finally, any feedback that you have, guys, for us uh, is much appreciated. If you, if you think we can improve or implement something new, we are open to discussion. So email one of uh, four of us and we'll, uh, we'll be happy to consider. And now, uh, with that said, thank you again, everyone who participated, to the speakers and uh, Agustino, you wanted to add something, please. Yeah, thanks, Igor. I think you pretty much said what I wanted to say. And I would like to thank uh, both Max and Jeremy Mank for giving uh, very interesting talks uh, on topics that definitely are of interest to the community. I also want to apologize that I was having a private chat with Jeremy Mank about uh, 
yeah, I've told them that I intentionally email and we found the right body. So apologize for, for doing that. I wanted what, to express some appreciation for uh, the talk of Remain. So nothing, uh, no intention of spamming you. And uh, yeah, and then I think uh, again, um, um, please send any feedback you have about the format of the talk or if you like have any suggestion on how we can improve the seminar series because I, mean, I think we are very grateful for your participation and uh, I mean, the success of the series depends a lot on uh, like your participation, feedback, questions and I mean, things that the community should be doing or working on. And with that said, I would like to close out uh, the recording part uh, of the um, seminar and looking forward to have more interactions in the informal part.